while we're on the topic of of the collections and the horns and stuff, you mentioned that you have a few with you also on the side. I do, I do. Um, now let's see. Uh, you've seen you've seen the the B flat, okay, the B flat uh, uh, top action rotary cornet and orchestra cornet. Can you talk? Can you talk briefly about the the orchestra cornet and oh, the, the uh, orchestra cornet? It's just it's basically just a different pattern. It's a long instrument, a little more like a modern trumpet, mm -hmm. um, with you know in B flat with a tuning slide out front, kind of like a kind of like a modern trumpet in, in yeah. uh, a lot of ways. A little little wider bell throat, you know. So it it is a true cornet. Hmm. Um, this instrument was made by John F. Stratton of New York. Mm -hmm. You see the uh, the imprint. Mm -hmm. And he was a major manufacturer of brass band instruments during the Civil War period. He got rich selling brass band instruments and bugles to the Union Army. Mm -hmm. um, and one of and, and his his business was one of the first big examples of of, of uh, outsourcing manufacture. Well, not actually outsourcing, but but uh, move, he moved his factory from New York to to uh, Bohemia mm -hmm. because the labor was cheaper. Oh, yeah. He could actually manufacture the same instruments and ship them to New York cheaper than he could have them built in New York. Yeah, well, wow. So, uh, <laughs> and he had one of the largest factories in Europe at the time. Um, I have a number of Stratton instruments, and they're you know they're pretty good instruments. They're not great, but they're not bad. And he sold vast quantities of them. Uh, a lot of the instruments that you see in photos of the Civil War bands with over the shoulder horns, mm -hmm. those are John F. Stratton. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. is, do you have a ballpark date for that particular instrument? Uh, this probably post Civil War, I would say. It might be Civil War, probably post Civil War. You know, maybe eighteen sixty-five to seventy, something like that. And now, is it referred to as an orchestral horn because that's yeah. like they actually used it in orchestras, or is that just this a... would be this would be the style that was promoted for use in. Interesting. It's just a just a different layout of the mm -hmm. The same, you know, the same tapers, the same mandrels, same tubing, same valve block. It's just laid out differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a very prominent zipper seam on that one. You can oh, see yeah. It too. oh yeah, oh <laughs> yeah. That was typical construction. The the uh, you can you can see right here. You can see that uh, that zipper mm -hmm. seam. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Probably the earliest one that I have here. Well, I've got a couple pretty early instruments. Um, uh, this is an E flat keyed bugle. Mm -hmm. and this was probably made in the 1840s or 50s. It's a European import, unsigned. Uh, it appears to be a copy of a Graves or E.G. Wright E flat cornet, mm -hmm. and it's a, it's a it's not a bad little instrument. It, um, I I bought it on eBay and had Rob Stewart restore it, and uh, I've used it in quite a few performances. Um, let's see if I can get a, a toot out of it. <laughs> First notes of the day. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Now, can you play the? Uh, it's actually can, a sweet little instrument. Though. Can you yeah. play the end of that tune that fast? <laughs> First thing in the morning. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, let's see. I have to remember it. Yeah, no, it's yeah. Okay. <laughs> just, me just messing with you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. of course. That that that's always an interesting tune because like kind of a a common topic of conversation with just like early brass instruments in general is people kind of have the generalized assumption that early on the music was like uh uh pr pretty watered down and not yeah. very <laughs> difficult and then like that no. that piece is like inc oh, no. incredibly virtuosic like and yeah. Yeah, Beautiful. yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a chop buster. Yeah, okay, for so, sure. And you know, being Ned Kendall's uh, uh, showpiece, um, you can imagine, you know, just just what a virtuoso on the instrument that he really was. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, it's this is a this is a man killer. This little this little one. <laughs> it's, it's not easy to play. Yeah. Um, see the next probably the next oldest instrument I br I brought out today. I, this was an eBay purchase in about 1999, and this is if you can see the whole thing. This is an upright B flat soprano sax horn, and this is the mm -hmm. original sax horn pattern as <laughs> as patented by Adolf Sax. Interesting. Okay, and and it has Berliner piston valves. And it tunes at the at the mouth pipe shank, and the entire uh, body of the instrument, once you get past the valve block, is conical. So yeah. it has a you know that that lovely almost flugelhornish sound. <laughs> Uh, and, and you think that that is a uh, this is probably sorry. French circa 1850 or so although these were still available through music dealers until well after the Civil War and the Berlin piston went from being state of the art to being the cheap alternative mm -hmm. as, as the valve system yeah mm -hmm. that's right it's so odd to look at because I'm so used to seeing like all the modern horns, you know, with all the compensating systems on it to sort of just to see like the big open space. <laughs> but, compensating system, right? right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You got to do it with your you're, face. But You're expected to be a man and right. blow the instrument in tune. Play the horn and don't let the horn play you. Yeah. yeah that's right. Yeah. Right. Remember that. Tell that to your students. Play yeah, definitely. Don't let the horn play you. Yeah. For yeah. sure. <laughs> And then with so with that one being a a, a French uh, likely a French origin that's yeah. not necessarily uh, an Adolf Sax horn it's just another no. French company that took that right. design. Right, it's it's a it's not an Adolf Sax. It's it's a, a no name. But these were mm -hmm. you know these were produced by a number of manufacturers and, and some of them were well known. It might be a Guichard. Um, that's that would be my guess. They produced a fast quantity. Mm -hmm. the, the um, but it's definitely not a a, a signed sax mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah gotcha okay. gotcha and then uh just back to the the keyed bugle for a second the keyed instrument when when did you start uh trying to learn and become familiar with keyed brasses well i i i wanted a keyed bugle ever since i got mark elrod's book and I had the opportunity to buy a, a six-key B-flat bugle from Ron Johnson of Cooperstown, New York, who's a fellow collector, a, a fine player, a lovely man, a um, good friend. And he was selling his B-flat key bugle that he had been playing with the Cooperstown uh, Farmers Museum band, hmm. uh, which he led, uh, in order to buy a uh, Cornopians, so that you could uh, you know, have a wider variety of players, so you could have different players fill in as necessary. Mm -hmm. Cornopian plays like a, a modern instrument; it's fingered the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, oh shoot! I didn't bring Cornopian down with me. Um, I saw that you were the, selling a few of those recently on eBay. Uh, yeah, <laughs> in fact, those are Ron Johnson's Cornopians that. that oh, okay. Sell. Okay, but I sold the. I I, I bought the. I, I actually had sold that key bugle also, but I bought that key bugle from Ron and learned uh, learned just by breaking out some easy music in the, in the key of um, you know, written key of C and learning learning the fingerings. You know, the, the I mean, they follow a really logical logical system. You're just opening, except for the leading tone key, you're opening mm -hmm. holes further up to get the higher overtones. <laughs> Interesting. It is it comparable? Do you know to any of the woodwind mechanisms, or is it essentially its, its own really, thing? It's, 
it's, a, it's its own system, although it operates on, on a similar principle to, uh, to, to uh, for instance, the, the, this is, uh, this would be oh, about the same length as a soprano sax, or no, an alto saxophone. This would be the same length as an alto saxophone mm -hmm. uh, in E flat. Uh, it functions by opening holes in the body of the instrument. Oh. And, it, and the overtones break at the octave rather than the 12th, like a clarinet. But otherwise, the key systems are completely different. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you're using a, uh, you're using a, uh, a, uh, a lip vibrating mouthpiece rather than a reed yeah. mouthpiece. Yeah, yeah, of course. And then we see the, the two horns behind you also. I know Yari is, has talked to us, especially in his first episode, about various bugles and clarons and stuff. But are, are those notable behind you, the two horns? Um, uh, one is unsigned. Let's see. This, this one is an unsigned Civil War period bugle, um, clarón bugle. It's uh, brass, all brass. Um, I bought it at an antique mall in Virginia, hmm. and it's a, you know I've used it on Civil War gigs. In fact, uh, let's see. I don't. I I have a poster of me playing this instrument. It's up against the wall here. You can't see it, but hmm. me playing this this instrument at uh, Arlington. Oh, nice. For, okay. a, uh, for, for a concert at, uh, at the new mansion. And it's a nice little horn. For, for the condition it's in, it plays really well. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah it's nice. I love, I love the battered look of it, too. <laughs> the instrument on the, on the other side is actually uh, by an important maker, uh, uh, Joseph A. Rohe, and it's signed down here, J. A. Rohe a uh, Paris, hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Paris, and he had a uh, a store in New York. He he was actually German. Um, he moved to New York for a while, had operated a music store, imported instruments that he that he had made, primarily actually in in, in uh, Germany and France, hmm. and uh, I. I uh, for a while, I had a, a uh, Berlin piston Rohe E flat tuba, circa mm, 1855 or so. Uh, I sold that to Mark Jones, who's another uh, collector. He's, mm -hmm. I, I, think, I think you've interviewed him, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, I've been in touch with yeah. Mark pretty yeah. regularly. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this instrument by Rohe, probably, I think that it dates from 1850 or 18. 48 to 63 i think no oh, well. so it's it's probably a pre-war instrument although it might be wartime it has mm -hmm. the the more french construction with a with a seam here and then a gusset right here oh yeah the, oh, okay the, the pie cut kind of thing right? the pie cut exactly yeah. and it's a it's a you know it's not a bad little horn too that one can play faster yeah <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, dad joke. If I ever heard one, <laughs> that's okay. That's that's, that's, uh, that's that's what makes this fun. Yeah. Um, so let's see. I've got a few other instruments that I that I brought. Um, let's see. The instrument that I play primarily in in the Excelsior Cornet Band and the Federal City Brass Band is this uh, side action E flat uh, rotary cornet by by uh, Paul and Quinby of Boston. And this instrument was <clears throat> purchased on eBay also, and it actually was uh, presented by the members of the Brooklyn Cornet Band, and that's Brooklyn, California, which is <laughs> now uh, Oakland. Okay. Okay. To Amos H. Bangle, leader, uh, October 11th, 1866. So this instrument is wartime pattern, a D.C. Hall pattern, um, made by the successor company, Hall and Quinby. Uh, of Boston, and it was made either 1865 or early 1866, and it's got the the pinched windway Allen rotary valves. You can see mm. how the windways are, are squashed down. And there's the there's mm. the, 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 the the noon chime. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll get back to that as soon as it stops. <laughs> Sounds like it's uh, making a brass instrument. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the anvil chorus yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> so anyway this this instrument has uh, has the pinched windway allen valves which uh the 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 
the rotors are very small in diameter, but the cutouts in them, the ports in them, maintain the same volume in cross section as the cylindrical tubing, and it makes mm -hmm. the stroke very short and very quick. Mm -hmm. So this is a very fast. You can play very fast passages. <laughs> Stewart did a marvelous job in this going. Um, it's, a, it's really a pleasure to play, at least as far as E flat cornets go. <laughs> uh, yeah. Another, another uh, uh, E flat cornet that I brought. This is an iconic instrument. Okay, this you'll mm. see in just about every Civil War period band. This is a John F. Stratton over the shoulder E flat cornet. Mm -hmm. And we know that this one dates to 1864 because the inscription says presented to Lieutenant Colonel Henry R. Cowles by his friends, John F. Stratton, maker, New York. Henry, Henry R. Cowles was the second in command of the, I think it was the second Iowa Volunteer Infantry. And he retired due to, due to health reasons. He resigned his commission in 1864. So this was probably his going away present. Wow. Um, and, uh, you know, again, it's a Stratton. It's a pretty good player. It's not the best E flat cornet I've ever played, but it's in, in lovely condition. And, you know, real collector's piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah well. And it also yes. came with uh, with its uh, with its uh, period case. It's got a lovely walnut case, nice. which is nice. uh, off, off in the other room somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. I did bring a did bring a, a couple of other uh, instruments, including a, a over the shoulder E flat bass. Oh, here we go. <laughs> by, uh, this was actually made by John F. Stratton. Okay. okay, but it was it was uh, stenciled, retailed by to Oscar Kuhn. Okay, and you can see the the yeah, yeah. You, can, you can see the the, uh, the plaque on it. It's a Stratton shield, same yeah, right. engraver, but it's it's uh, it's marked as as O Kuhn, New York. Oscar Kuhn, who was a Civil War bandsman who had a music store after the war, and it has has Berliner pistons also. And mm -hmm. it's a it's a quite a quite a lovely player, you know, as far as as far as these instruments go. <laughs> not not yeah, a bad nice. horn. I'm a yeah, bad tuba player, but it's not a bad. One. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. uh, okay. Uh, Do you have maybe a, a total number of instruments that you have in your collection? <laughs> because I think what well, we were able to ask uh, uh, Ed Pierce from the First Brigade Band, and he was like, "Oh, funny you should mention." It. He was able to like list off all like four hundred instruments that they have. Or yeah, yeah. yeah, they've been yeah. collecting since the nineteen sixties. So. Yeah, right. yeah, they, they uh, had they a, have quite they had an a head extensive start. collection, and and for quite a while there, the rest of us had to outbid him on eBay. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, so anyway, <laughs> uh, between. Civil War instruments and my gig horns and uh, classic jazz trumpets and you know late 19th century early 20th century cornets um, and and you know miscellaneous oddball stuff probably at any given time around 250 horns. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Are are most of those in playing condition? Um, more or less. Some aren't, and some you know. Uh, I only have limited resources for restoration, so the the most interesting ones get restored, and the you know there there are a lot of others that, that are just you know they're sitting there. Maybe they'll get restored. Maybe the next owner will restore them. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Mm -hmm. uh, the, they, there's only so much time and money that I can put into these. 
Um, but right. I, a lot of them, I, you know, I own them because I basically rescued them from, mm. from the scrap heap or, or yeah, you know, yeah, whatever yeah. indignity they were going to suffer. And then they made me a lapse, things like that. Yeah, yeah. for sure. <laughs> right.